Benny um, today, but we do have um, two deputations uh, by appointment, and uh, if we could invite the um, uh, Graham Walker uh, um, to talk about the Heathcote flooding, um, if you could come to the table, and uh, we have. Remind them that we're filming. Did you do that? Oh, um, no, I, I, I should remind people that we're being live streamed, so um, if any councillors are speaking, to make sure they speak up, and also the same for those that are, are presenting as well. So welcome, and, um, and thank you for coming this morning. Thank you, Lady Chairman, for the opportunity to speak at this committee this morning. Uh, so the topic is flooding of the Heathcote River in the local and the total area. I've been a resident uh, in Waimea Terrace for 35 years now and have observed the river during peak flooding and gleaned information from engineers, geotech people and local residents. This is purely a discussion document. The problem is, it's simple, this present river cannot carry the volume of water entering its catchment area. And I'll go through the causes first in a little bit more detail than you've got in front of you. First is there has been a change in channel depth and width due to the earthquake's vertical land movement and it's 30, 300 millimetres higher at the estuary mouth, I believe, uh, the Heathcote estuary mouth. Uh, there's been, it's thought there's been a lot of lateral spread on both river banks. There's obviously sedimentation, especially in the lower reaches of the river. And there's been, if I may say so, no maintenance re-dredging at all over the years. <clears throat> Secondly, housing developments in the upstream floodplain have uh, caused huge runoff uh, off the hard landscapes, you know, the house roof, the, the driveway and so on, and uh, there's less soil because fewer gardens and uh, grass and there's less water absorption. There's excessive soil components entering the water as a colloid of silt and clay, etc., and this is laid down as a sediment where the river gets wider. Uh, and some of these developments include Aidenfield, Hallsville on the Park, Wigram Strife, Worsley Spur and Westmoreland. Next, the effectiveness of the river management strategy, you're probably aware of it, uh, includes two phases. The first phase allows water to go to run off the hills, adjacent hills, and they leave that, let that water run through for about three days. And the second phase uh, involves a catchment basin, I presume dikes, I haven't really seen it, and they release that water after three days and let the rest of the water go down to the Heathcote, uh, to the estuary. And lastly, extreme weather events that we're all aware of, <coughs> especially the heavy rain associated with the big cyclones, and a lot of them are coming out of the tropics with a tonne of water on them. A uh, recent phenomenon of climate change, uh, you'll be aware that the 5th of March cyclone, which is the big one, delivered 160 uh, centimetres plus on the Heathcote area, and that's seven inches uh, in 36 hours. Now, a prevention measures. First uh, would be a, a damn good idea to dredge the riverbed by one metre and build metre stop banks where needed using large scoop loaders and this is a, something either for the commercial people or even the army. And plant banks which have new trees, shrubs and grasses on them because if you put soil around mature trees there's a very likelihood that there'll be um, ring barking due to the moisture. Secondly, dredge the estuary from the Heathcote mouth into the centre of the estuary with a very large channel uh, because once you get to the centre of the estuary it goes downhill uh, 300 mils to the Avon mouth. So there's a 300 mil rise at the, you probably all know this, 300 up at the estuary, at the Heathcote and 300 mils down so the estuary's on a tilt. Right? I've heard this from Geo, Geo Tech. 
Uh, widen certain areas of the river using bank stabilisation techniques that I know nothing about, but you'd have to because if you don't, you'll have collapsing river banks, which you see anyway, and uh, <coughs> you'd probably have to widen them by a metre at least on either side, depending on which area you're talking about. Uh, remove unnecessary vegetation along the banks, which impede water flow, especially flax, large grasses, some trees and shrubs. And next, halt further upstream housing development as the catchment devices they use, such as ponding and swales, appear ineffectual and too few. Now, I'm going to miss the next one for a minute. Uh, the last one I've got there is to foolproof houses by erasing their foundations, this is obvious, rather than red zoning and destroying the local community. Apparently, it's also possible to plastic wrap a house around its base uh, as a short term measure. Um, and the last one is very speculative. Uh, do you drill a hole through the port hills with a pipeline from the mid Heathcote River, for example, Meth uh, sorry, Bonevale or St Martins, to Littleton Harbour? Because there is a difference in height above sea level of about five metres, which would allow a downward flow. And uh, I'm not sure that the Littleton people would be happy with that, but it's an interesting idea. <laughs> Finally, there can be no delay. This is a because time is of the essence. Thank you very much. Are there any comments? You've got your bullet. Thank you. Any point. questions, um, Councillor Clearwater? Thank you, Graham. Um, your, your point about um, flood proofing houses by high foundations, um, I understand that around the Mid Heathcote, some houses have been um, raised, the levels have, levels have been raised some years ago. Right. Do you want to comment on how they've fared, um, especially during oh, this period? The well, highest uh, rainfall we've had in 150 years. <laughs> the, um, I, I, oh. <clears throat> I'm a builder, my name's Roger oh. Kershaw, and I did an extension on a house um, five years ago in Waimea Terrace. Um, we raised the, the extension at the back um, in, the, in the March the first event, uh, the back, piece at the back was fine, the addition at the back. The old house was, was lower and that had six inches of water through through the house in the lower section. Um, new section? New section, fine. That's further back the section. But, um, which, new, which level did you raise it to? Uh, we, we raised it, uh, it was uh, 300 mils from the existing um, house foundation or floor so, level so, of the so old house. So that's on top of the 400 freeboard? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Now, yeah. The cost of doing that, interestingly enough, about 15 years ago was uh, you had $10,000 at that time allowable, and the owner only had to pay 1000 So it was a 10% deposit, if you like, on raising that up. The, the house that nowadays, we, the house that we did five years ago, they, these people, because they were flooded, they um, went through the process of raising the the, the existing house, the, the, the older part of the house, yep. and the price for that was $160,000. Really? So, <clears throat> like she said to me last night, that really um, wouldn't justify spending that much for the <clears throat> um, cost of the house. I'm, I'm I, I, I was gobsmacked. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I, I said, I, she said well, to me, what do you think? Language. And I said, well, probably <laughs> 60,000. And she said, I'll add another 100 to it. It's probably mm. the cost of the big piles, who knows? Oh, I see. So it was additional piling as well. Would well, probably would. Mm. No, it's not TCC. No, but because it, that, that would have been prior to the, um, to the land. I mean, people would have tested land in that area oh, yeah, anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. I mean, it might be worthwhile having a look at that. Now, um, Roger, if I may say, Roger had uh, his area, his section uh, surveyed just recently, and uh, apparently he's had lateral. His section has got 150, is 150 mils? Well, when, bigger? When they, when they came it's 150 mils bigger. Lateral, uh, <laughs> lateral no, spread. No, no, the council owned 150 mils less. So the guys that came around, they said, what's happened? There's been a, a lateral spread. Yeah. To, to the river. Yeah. Our, our sections haven't got smaller and we haven't got bigger, but <laughs> we've got less river. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally get that. Uh, Raf, you had a question. Sorry, can you just explain um, the upstream housing development and the impact on obviously the downstream flows? I mean, what are we 
doing wrong in terms of those developments that is causing an impact downstream? Well, I haven't been, I haven't been had feet on the ground there, have you? No, I, I don't. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask. Is, I mean, I, I was brought up in Horsell, um, and when the Oakland's um, development was first started, and, and we never had any, um, we had a big drain across our open drain, um, that's now been closed down. And, and I don't understand how these swales work. And that was one of my questions today, really. Um, there's a lot of houses. I mean, Aidens Field, now Blue Skies, Halls on the Park, um, Milne's Estate. Now, they all flow in somewhere along the line to the Heathcote River. And um, some of them have been diverted to the Horsell, I believe. On the other side of Junction Road, I, my understanding is that the stormwater there goes into the Horsell River, which goes into Lake Ellesmere. Um, is the stormwater contained in these swales and then um, is, are they uh, floodgated so that therefore the water stays in there and then when the Heathcote drops, the water is released? Um, or does it just flow in the, in the event, does the water just flow into these swales and then straight away into the Heathcote River? I don't quite understand it. But there is a I, lot of water. I don't think anyone is technically able to answer <laughs> yeah. your question yeah. here. Yeah. But but we, I mean, that will be part of the report that we're getting from the task force. So yep. um, we and this will is know exacerbated the by the well uh, subsoil, uh, as you know, or you might know, Hallswell and uh, some of these uh, areas have got a lot of clay underneath. I mean, yeah. it's not Rolleston, so where does the water drain to? That's what yeah. I want to know, yeah. especially at the super saturated state at the moment. Yeah, no, that's good, um, Yanni. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned that while we're part of the task force. That's something I have specifically asked that we review our subdivision consenting yeah, to ensure yeah. that um, not just what they've put in, but actually in some cases, have they actually put in what they said they were going to put in? So we'll, we'll get to the bottom of that. Um, I just wanted to ask you though about um, post earthquake, what the differences are post earthquake versus before the earthquake. How, mu how much of the recent flooding would you attribute to the earthquake? and the effects of the earthquake versus what used to happen before? Uh, well, of course, there's been two large rain events uh, recently, but uh, the last time it flooded was, I think it was 15 months ago, and it used to flood. Are you talking about pre-earthquake? Yes. Oh, it didn't used to. And just an understanding, you yeah, know, yeah, before it, the earthquake, it, it, what was it like and what's it been like it in the recent... It never flooded months? more than just, in our case, just over the road just burst its banks slightly, and it's used to occur approximately every three or four years. But it's not, I mean, let's talk about the time it takes. I mean, I don't want to get emotional, but uh, one minute you see the, the, the river in, in its banks, the next, about an hour later, it's, it's up level, and about an hour and a half later, your house is surrounded by it. Yeah, it's I the think... speed of it. That, I think, uh, I think, imagine I think... all this runoff. You know, it was a small river once upon a time, and they're trying to overload it all this with this runoff. It's not necessarily coming off the hills. Some of it is. I think uh, Phil's question at the beginning, where he prefaced it by saying, you know, the wettest um, mm. months um, on record since they began in 1864, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> has, has contributed because I think yeah. that the land's been saturated and it yeah. hasn't had time to recover. Yeah. Um, before we've had another deluge, and I, you know that that has certainly contributed to the problem. Um, but it, you know, we're, I, I guess that um, what we saw in, in those areas um, on certainly, um, you know, on the on the big day, the sixth of March, but but then subsequently um, on Good Friday uh, and um, and on um, uh, Monday this week, mm. you know, it was just. Mm. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's too much. So, so I, I guess that's been the driver behind the Can we just board. say there's an overlay on this? It's called pollution? Yeah. So if you've got a house, A, that's got water inside with sewage yeah. and, and or a garden with sewage and uh, you're trying to grow things, yeah. it's not a good look. Um, um, I, I've been in the area only nine years, so I'm, I'm relatively new. That, that we're talking about the Beacon and Loop type thing. Um, uh, the people I did the alteration for, they've been in there 12. And to answer your question, it was that, that it used to flood, say, um, once every four years. And, and that would be, you know, it might come through the gate and it might be two to, you know, 75 mils of water, 100 mils of water. Not, not to the extent that we're getting now. Yeah. And the other thing is that the water would go down very quickly. Now, the reason we didn't get a problem, I think it was Cyclone 
eater or something? No, that was the one that had nothing, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, sorry, this, this last one. The yeah. reason it didn't come up as far as it could have, it was low tide. If everyone looks at the low tide charts, yeah. if that had been high tide, I bet you it would have been that much higher. So oh, well, our house is um, 70 metres from the river, so we're up a back, back drive. Um, <clears throat> and we, um, the first event, we had water to the um, underside of our floor, which is about 600 mils. Now, the problem is it comes up a long drive, the next long drive away long from us, upstream, and then flows round our place and then down our drive. So um, it's, just, it's a... Like I said to Graham the other day, the, the water, the, the river channel cannot take the volume of water that, that's coming down that river at the moment. Yeah. And, it, and it's like um, in the early part of the 19th century, um, when the Waimak used to burst its banks, you know, it's the water from the headwaters. What they do, they put increase the stock bank size. Mm. So we've either got to go deeper with the channel or increase the height of the stock Thank bank. you both very much. Um, really appreciate that. I, I know that the um, Acting Chief Executive has got quite a you know, significant report in her report about mm. um, the task force. So. Um, we will um, get to that when we get to that. But thank you very much for... We're hopefully coming to the next meeting on May the 5th in the Beckenham Service Centre, which is going to relate to short, medium, long-term. Oh, Are going to mention that, Phil? Yep. Yes, and so um, council staff have kindly agreed to go to the next Spraden Heathcote Community Board and there'll be a special presentation on flooding around the mid-Heathcote. And so these issues will be discussed and, and the staff will, have, uh, will put out some solutions too, I'm sure. Excellent. So thank, thank you very much for thank coming. You. Thank, um, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could I invite Robert White to come forward? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my deputation is on behalf of the. Uh, the uh, Moa Residence Group and the uh, Peterborough Village uh, Committee. It you, follows you, on. You can feel free to sit down if you would like. I, I prefer standing. Yeah, no, no, that's it, also it, absolutely fine. I find it helps my memory better if I stand. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm here at the suggestion of Councillor Jani Johansson. It, uh, it follows on from a, a deputation made to the Hagley Ferry Meet community boards some weeks ago, in which um, we argued the case for doing what the council wants to achieve with the reconstruction of Salisbury Street, uh, as opposed to what the organisation Skirt wants to achieve with the reconstruction, and, and, and as, a, as it announced to local residents. The, um, Recon reconciling the two organisations' responsibilities is what I hope to try and achieve and what I'm hoping the Council will achieve because I think there are bigger issues at stake. Uh, so rather than talk about uh, self-interest of the neighbourhood, I thought I'd try and put the arguments in the context of the, of the Local Government Act and the Council's responsibility to satisfy full, full well-beings environmental, social, cultural and economic. Salisbury Street is one of a number of streets in our neighbourhood that are boundary to boundary asphalt. Salisbury Street and Kilmore Street were designed as one-way streets to get vehicles from A to B as quickly as possible, with no thought to the surrounding land use. That was pre-1989. But since then, we've had uh, designation of land use for high-density housing, the consequent loss of private green space, and the desire for some co compensatory green space within the, the uh, street environment. The provision of green space in the road reserve has uh, a number of environmental values. I suggest... Uh, 
some of these would be the, um, the, the need to attenuate flows entering our rivers and streams by reducing the amount of runoff, 100% runoff with 100% asphalt, introduce green space, you reduce that runoff and you can also improve water quality at the same time. There's a desire for green space by people who have lost green space on their private property because of high density development. There's the ecological value of providing a habitat for birds and insects and other fauna. There's the cultural aspect. Christchurch prides itself on being a garden city. And the council has done tremendous work in that regard in the past. Uh, do you know Gracefield Avenue that runs off Salisbury Street and connects into um, Durham Street? That, that's, that's still got the original street design there where you have a, a raised carriageway going into a grass berm and then into deep concrete just channels and then a footpath adjoining the property. And trees at regu regular intervals and grass that have, to have the capacity to detain water, filter out contaminants and provide climatic benefits with the presence of trees. And then there's, much later on, there was the decision to make Chester Street east and west into residential streets of high density. And the council did a wonderful job of reconstructing those streets with uh, berms and trees. And then, in fact, they had the, fa the effect of stimulating uh, redevelopment because people found it so attractive and a desirable place to live. So that, that, that's the cultural aspect. The, the, the social aspect is that for everybody, the, the street environment is the most immediate open, public open space where a variety of things can happen, not just getting people from A to B. The economic aspect is that um, a lot of those values I've just mentioned can be, have a dollar value attached to them as well. So it's quite possible to say to a group of people, here are our options, the, the utility option, green space option, and uh, this is the cost of each, these are the benefits of each, and these are the dollar values of those benefits. <coughs> so I, I'm suggesting that when it comes to the work that a SCART does, it probably doesn't matter much to them which set of plans they use, whether it's a like-for-like -like reconstruction set of plans, adjusted from the previous plans to suit new levels, new ground levels, or whether it's a green street design, which uh, incorporates more green space and less asphalt. So that I wouldn't think the di di difference in cost would be that great. And I, I, I've had every confidence in the council staff of de deli delivering those designs, delivering the cost-benefit analysis and letting the councillors decide based on their responsibilities. Uh, I think I've covered everything I intended to cover. So uh, I'm open to questions now. Thank you very much. Um, Yanni, would you like to start off with the question? Sure, thank you. Um, Thank, thank you, Robert, for making the deputation. Um, I think it would be useful if you just tell councillors what the response was from Skirt when you raised around the, what was happening in Salisbury Street, going back like for like. Oh, right. <laughs> um, and, and probably just a, a little bit of context around some of the local planning, you know, that, that Peter, I know around Peterborough Street, for example, and some of the local residents have done around the, the, the opportunity for a different, you know, a different way of... Um, living in the central city. Oh, right. Uh, well, I'm a relatively new member of the uh, committee, so uh, unfortunately the people who know more about that kind of thing weren't available at such short notice. Um, but regarding skirts, skirts uh, have no capacity for exercising discretion or initiating a different design approach. They, they believe they have a job to replace like for like based on the, uh, the insurance liability for reconstruction. 
So I, I, I think it's something needs to trigger that uh, ability of skirt to respond to uh, a, a different plan, a different design. Uh, the, the, there is a, I'm quite amazed at the uh, closeness of the, uh, particularly the Peterborough Village Committee, uh, neighbourhood rather. They, they, they do have wonderful turnouts to meetings and they, they have guest speakers to talk about uh, architects and landscape architects and people who really know how to make a difference to the character of a neighbourhood. And we've, the, the committee's gone to a lot of trouble to engender that uh, excitement in the, of the possibilities that lie before us uh, with the rebuild. That's all I'm, I'm able to say, I'm afraid. I think just for councillors, so the people have contacted Skirt directly. Um, as a result of the Skirt response, they came to the community board. Um, and now in our agenda later on, we've got revised transport projects, which is about deferring the public realm work in Kilmore Street. Um, so, and, and Salisbury Street is also mentioned. So, you know, I think it, just to give some context to that deputation, but I thought it was important for you to hear directly from the local resident. Yes. Very good. Okay, well look, thank you very much um, uh, Mr White for coming to the council. It's very much appreciated and obviously that will assist us when we get to um, a later item on the agenda. So um, very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so.